Prof. Kitai has acted as consultant for universities and community-based organizations in the US and abroad. She has also provided her professional services to various committees and boards working in the areas of women's issues, disability rights, and diversity and inclusion amongst others. Through this work, Prof. Kite has had a lasting impact on the theory and practice of the ethics of care and care work. She has been particularly influential in bringing together feminism, issues related to the ethics of care, issues related to diversity and inclusion, and disability. Through her own experience as the parent and carer of a disabled person, she brings unique insight into her work and combines the theoretical issues and the practical aspects of living in a family with disability. Please join me in welcoming Prof. Kite. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I have very much enjoyed my time at in Malta. Can you hear me? Um, <laughs> let me see. Can't see a word. How about like that? Can you hear me like that? Okay. Um, it's been wonderful seeing your beautiful sights and learning about the kinds of things you do here and the very progressive views you have on questions of disability. Uh, it's been a, a very, very impressive um, number of things that I have learned here, and I thank you very much for having me. So Albert uh, Kurihara, a Japanese-American who was interned after the attack on Pearl Harbor, writes, I remember having to stay at the dirty horse stables at Santa Anita. I remember thinking, am I a human being? Why are we being treated like this? You see a dark-skinned woman seated on the ground, apparently cooking something on some logs, fabric-like tents in the background. Abel, a 20-year-old from Afghanistan living in the jungle of Calais, the makeshift camp in France, says to his interviewer, they treat us like animals, he continues. We are human. These people are someone's son. They are someone's brother. This is a nightscape, city nightscape. Several protesters are facing a row of riot police. A Fox News reporter tries to fathom why someone would be protesting the police shooting of Keith Lamont Scott in the streets of Charleston, South Carolina. Scott, who is black and had traumatic brain injury, was killed when he failed to obey police commands. The woman he addresses, uh, the woman he addresses, the reporter addresses, shouts out in undisguised anger. If I cross the street on which Scott was shot, I could still be shot there by the police. Then she asks the reporter, do you see me? We are not the same. We are human, but I am black and you are white. And in those statements, she effectively says that her blackness is treated as if somehow it occludes her humanity. What do we learn to these uh, as responses to these moral outrages? Why this invocation of we are human? The early Karl Marx provides some illumination when he writes, man is a species being, not only because in practice and in theory he adopts the species, his own as well as those of others, as his object, but, and this is only another way of expressing it, also because he treats himself as the actual living species, because he treats himself as a universal and therefore a free being. In each of these situations, we learn of instances where the treatment of human beings makes them feel that their own instantiation as a universal and free being is under threat. 
They face the possibility of no longer feeling human. Humans cannot feel human without the enculturated ways they understand living as a human, having means by which to eat, sleep, excrete, congregate, engage productively as human beings. Humans cannot live as free humans when they daily face the existential threat of being gunned down because they are black. Indeed, the woman at the demonstration protesting the killing of Keith Scott echoes the words of Patrice Cullors. I think I have that slide. The woman responsible for turning Black Lives Matter into a hashtag. Black Lives Matter reminds people that black people are human. But more importantly, it reminds black people that we are human. Now imagine a philosopher who answers each with with uh, much sympathy, since this is not an unsympathetic philosopher. Of course, it is true that you are human, but this fact in itself is not a reason for you to make moral claims of any sort, much less moral claims on me. Human is only a biological category, the species Homo sapiens. As it is a natural and not a normative concept, being human has no moral, or at best, only weak moral significance. If it could make demands, the fact that you are human by itself could make demands no different from what any non-human animal may make on me. To acknowledge your claim to make any stringent moral demand on me, and indeed to know your, uh, uh, um, is indeed to know your intrinsic properties, and those of who you speak, irrespective of species membership, your characteristics, your intrinsic properties. If these are morally relevant intrinsic properties, then it is only by virtue of possessing them that you can make claims on me or on any other moral agent. At best, such a response would be greeted with bewilderment most all people, whether or not they are philosophers, understand the implicature, as we say in philosophy. Being human, I am owed obligations that are stringent and which have been denied to me in these situations. But as philosophers, we're supposed to confound the obvious. Nonetheless, as Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes the obvious is just that obviously true. Perhaps the assertion that one is human has the moral impact it does just because the idea of the human is morally thick. While it is hard to imagine any philosopher questioning the moral import of invocating one's humanity in contexts like the ones above, a philosopher once asked me during a question and answer period, why the humanity of my daughter gives her a moral claim to better treatment than that of an intelligent animal such as a pig? The question has arisen on more than one occasion. This is because my daughter, Sasha, uh, who is pictured here uh, with enjoying my hug, is uh, as is clear from you know, as is clear from her delighted expression. Sesha is a beautiful woman of 48 with lively brown eyes and a winning smile. She has very significant cognitive disabilities. She has no measurable IQ and can do nothing for herself by herself. She defies the philosophical characterizations of what is human, namely the possession of certain essential attributes assumed to be definitive of the human. She is often written out of our moral treatises, though human, she surely is. If the theory that makes arguments and proclamations about what all humans are due, then proceeds to exclude some humans, it seems fair to ask about the adequacy of that theory. Where people with her disabilities are included, the portrayals are rarely empirically adequate. When the distorted representations of women, sexual minorities, and people of color 
creep into philosophical texts. Not only do they perpetuate harmful stereotypes, they also give a false picture of human life as such. The same holds true for disability. Respectable contemporary philosophers have, for instance, spoken of the radically or severely mentally impaired as unable to recognize familiar people in their lives, as having cognitive abilities comparable to those of a dog, as always remaining at the mental age of an infant, although it is often unclear whether they're speaking of actual people or some hypothetical case. My daughter was classified as, and the expression was, profoundly mentally retarded. It was then a medical classification, which is no longer used. Yet she fits none of the descriptions we find in this philosophical literature. Neither do they describe the children and adults who live in my daughter's community, nor the children of the many parents of disabled children whom I've come to know. Some medical materials do speak of a mental age, but professional organizations that work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have urged that this language be dropped, as it's terribly misleading. While my daughter may not be able to do much more than a very young child, her understanding outstrips her manifest physical abilities. For example, she spends her weekends with us listening and thrilling to music, ranging from Bach to Mahler, from Louis Armstrong to Bob Dylan. When favorite Schubert or Beethoven pieces play, she tries to catch my eye, so I will hum along. And engaging her ability to choose between two options, she has indicated to me, as best as I can tell, that she prefers to be regarded as a young woman, not a child. Again, let me be clear, my daughter has no measurable IQ. While there are surely those who are still more disabled, she is already in the category of those most disabled. If philosophy is to be true to itself and help us understand both who we are and what it means to be human beings living in a world with other creatures, then theories that leave out some human lives are unlikely to fully grasp the human condition. As I have lived my life with one so excluded, I have become increasingly convinced that by ignoring her truth, we distort our own. If we mean to understand the voices, um, if we mean to understand the voices I invoked at the start of this talk, we need to get clear on what, if anything, is morally important about being human, being human in all its different forms. The received view in philosophy holds that moral status depends on the possession of morally intrinsic properties. This is a philosophical view, but it's not only a philosophical view. There are many such properties, the capacity for practical reasoning, the ability to form a life's narrative, the capacity to care and be empathetic, to have a subjective understanding of the self, among others. But these are neither shared universally nor possessed only by human beings. On the one hand, pegging the moral significance we give to being human on any such intrinsic properties has the negative effect of excluding some who are otherwise evidently human. On the other, a more positive effect is to compel, uh, to consider, compel us to consider some animals the moral equals or near equal of humans. While raising the status of animals is an important moral challenge for our age, viewing moral status as tied solely to these intrinsic properties fails to give us an understanding of why the claim to humanity has the particular moral importance it has for us humans. Intrinsic properties, however, are not the only sort of properties an individual may possess. As human beings, we also possess properties that we have only in virtue of relationships we are in with other human beings. These are relational properties. 
I propose that we turn to these relational properties to understand the moral significance of being human. That significance lies in being able to live our lives among other human beings as equals. Living life as a human being and in the recognition that one is a human being like all other human beings is what moral parity with our fellow humans demands. The intrinsic properties that a human being possesses are not determinative of whether that human being possesses an equal moral status. More definitive are our relational properties. That's the position I hope to defend. In the name of assigning a special moral status for humans, what's come down to us through the ages is the specification of familiar capacities and properties, all the usual suspects. However, two canonical figures stand out for their influence and their paradigmatic formulations of the capacities of human beings as moral beings. John Locke and Immanuel Kant. For Locke, what counted as the distinctively moral nature of a human was expressed in his definition of the person, which then became the touchstone for further discussions of personhood. Man, he wrote, is, quote, nothing but a participant of the same continued life united to the same organized body. In contrast, a person is a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places. Locke, in proclaiming the equality of man, meant not the equality of all humans, but only of those who instantiate moral man or the person. Disability, whether physical or cognitive, was thought to render a human a monster. But for Locke, it was the condition of the idiot, the impairment of mind, that truly excluded these humans from personhood. Locke places the idiot at the margins of humanity by identifying the idiot with the mythic changeling a child of the devil, human in form only, who, has, who was swapped for the human baby shortly after birth. By identifying idiots with changelings, Locke's rendering has the mentally disabled individual share the fate of slaves, blacks, natives, Jews, and even women, who all, at some time, have been relegated to the category of the partial human, the subhuman and denied personhood. While the 17th century notion of a changeling sounds quaint to the modern ear, Locke strikes a more modern chord in the following passage. Were a monkey or any other creature to be found that had the use of reason to such a degree as to be able to understand general signs and to deduce consequences about general ideas, he would no doubt be subject to law and in that sense be a man, however so, uh, uh, how uh, much soever he differed in shape from others of that name. Locke's turns of phrase were likely just as an, an emphatic way of expressing what he took to be essential for a human to be a moral man or a person. But the sentence cited here might well have been uttered by contemporary philosophers who wish both to open the category of persons to non-human animals if they display appropriate abilities, and simultaneously to deny personhood to some who are born human but unable to display evidence of rational capacity. In that move, they deny the importance of species as a factor in determining moral standing, as well as nor narrowing the scope of which human beings have moral parity. They deny the notion, in other words, that all human beings are equal. We will turn uh, to them in a moment. For now, we should note the irony that the philosopher who was the locus classicus of the liberal ideal of equality 
did not mean that all human beings were equal any more than Thomas Jefferson, the slave owner, meant all men when he declared that all men were created equal. For Kant, like Locke, rationality constitutes moral personhood. Kant maintains that only rational human nature supplies the ability to act benevolently on principle and adds that nothing else in nature can supply this. This makes man alone in the natural world worthy, he thought, of a special moral place and a special moral status. This special moral status conferred by dignity belongs to all human beings, even those who at the time lack the capacity for rational deliberation. However, a Kantian such as John Rawls, important political philosopher, uh, takes up the question of disability only to set it aside. The case of disability, whether temporary or permanent, and other costly medical interventions, he believed, could be postponed until justice under ideal conditions was decided upon. Accepting that equality is what he called a range concept, which, as Rawls remarks, puts everyone inside a circle within which they're all equal, no matter how close or distant they are from the center. He wondered whether those who are either too medically costly or cannot exercise what he called the two moral powers can be accommodated within it. Some in the Kantian tradition have suggested a form of derivative membership, placing people who are mentally disabled under the trusteeship or guardianship of another. But just as they can be easily added in this manner, so they can be easily removed. It becomes e easy, easy to ask, since they fail to have the relevant intrinsic properties, why society at large should have any investment at all in ensuring them a guardian or trustee? And why should any resources be put forward to their education, development, or protection? Whether we adopt a Lockean social contract theory or a Rawlsian one, chances are that my daughter is locked out, either as a moral person or as a citizen. My daughter gives no clear evidence of having what John Rawls called the two moral powers, which are a sense of justice and an ability to form and revise a sense of one's own good. She gives no clear evidence of acting benevolently from principle. Even if she does, her inability to communicate such things through language would mean that this ability could not be gleaned. The Kantian autonomy of the will may be forever be beyond her grasp. Yet human she is. You know her human humanity in every movement, every look, every response. You know it when you see her thrill to music, giggle at something she finds funny, or reach out her arms to embrace you, when she puts her head down shyly or beams when complimented. She has the feel and touch and smell of a human being. And above all, she's my daughter. Fortunately, we've abandoned the cruel myths of mothers who give birth to disabled children as having consorted with the devil. There are no in, there's no interspecies reproduction here. There's simply a human child who was born with some impairments, who has some inabilities given the norm of the typically functioning human being. Among proponents of utilitarianism, of the philosophy of utilitarianism, she fares no better than with contract theories. A prominent group of philosophers James Rachels, Peter Singers, Jeff McMahon, among others, adopt a position they call moral individualism. They argue against the position that being human is morally significant and take the stance that any universal obligations we have is to individuals with morally relevant properties. If it is difficult to find any common morally salient properties that all humans possess, it's also difficult to find any such properties that humans alone possess or might possess. 
As we discover more and more about non-human animals, it becomes increasingly clear that we have seriously underestimated the cognitive capacities of many species, in part because we haven't yet understood how to assess them. <coughs> We also learn that other psychological capacities we think relevant for moral status, such as being social or having self-awareness or concern about others, are features that can be found in animal life. Morally consequential properties, such as higher cognitive and psychological characteristics and the ability to form a narrative structure of one's life, to have a conception of one's own death, to be able to imagine and carry out a life's project for oneself, properties that humans have assumed that they alone possess, may also be present in attenuated forms in other species. Those humans who lack these morally salient properties are, morally speaking, only marginal cases. In one recounting, these include uh, human embryos and fetuses, newborn infants, congenitally, severely, cognitively impaired human beings, human beings who have suffered brain damage or dementia, and human beings who have become irreversibly comatose. These marginal cases are used to pose the following question. If we provide special protections to them, then why not include within the protected class of beings members of other species with comparable or higher functioning. That is, those we should not eat, do medical experiments upon, unless they benefit from those experiments. Test cosmetic pro products upon, kill for the use of their organs, put on exhibition, and in general abuse in ways now viewed as only under the rubric of human rights violations. Although it is right that we should expand the circle of morally protected beings and see many of the uses as well as abuses of animals as morally objectionable, I reject the use of such so-called marginal humans to make the argument. The objectionable nature of the argument from marginal cases becomes more apparent in another version. This one claims not only that non-human animals with the requisite intrinsic properties should have some of the rights and protections enjoyed by human beings, but also that we should adjust downward the status of those so-called marginal humans to the level of the raised status of the non-human animals possessing such putatively comparable intrinsic properties. I want to voice five reasons to reject such a proposition. Oops, whoops, <laughs> too, too soon. Huh? Where's my, huh. I have, well, you'll find it elsewhere. <laughs> um, first, the terminology of marginal cases is morally irresponsible. Second, the idea that we should abandon moral parity for all human beings is morally hazardous. Third, the idea that one can compare intrinsic properties across species without regard to the species compared is flawed and unsupported. Fourth, the idea that giving preference to our own kind, and in this case our species, is inherently pernicious. I want to say that's an overgeneralization. And lastly, the focus on intrinsic properties to the neglect of relational ones ought to be replaced by an account that avoids the objectionable, false, and misleading features of the um, position I'm arguing against. First, the terminology. Marginal cases is an unfortunate term when applied to those who have an existence outside the womb, perhaps even inside the womb, where unlike the fetus, a person other than the mother can take care of them. There is nothing marginally human about people such as my daughter. We know from our history that legitimizing such a category provides a slot 
can be, a just, can be justification enough for those with the power to deprive, neglect, enslave, and even murder those who are only marginal. As moral philosophers, we need to do ethics in a morally responsible fashion. Second, the rejection of moral parity for all human beings. Peter Singer has proposed that, quote, we abandon the idea of the equal value of all human beings, replacing that with a more graduated view in which moral status depends on some aspects of cognitive disability, and that graduated view is applied to both humans and non-humans. That we ought to abandon the idea of the equal value of all humans is the sort of moral shocker that Singer sometimes resorts to in order to shake us out of our moral complacency. But the idea is accepted by many philosophers who call themselves moral individualists. This position of moral parity for human beings is one that I believe that we must hold fast to. Might even seem strange to you that I even have to say that. It is morally perilous to abandon it, especially now when in the United States we see, a, and in many parts of the world, we see a re resurgence of overt and unabashed white supremacy and neo-Nazism. Furthermore, I believe we can hold on to it without either devaluating other animals or adopting a view toward non-human animals that's akin to racism. It is true that in the West, religious and philosophical traditions, the scala naturae situates man lower than the gods, but superior to the beasts. But the objection to human special place should be lodged at the claim of superiority and its concomitant right to dominate over those lower on the scale, not at the moral parity of all human beings. The claim that humans are not equal threatens to plunge us backwards. The idea that all men were created equal was hard won, and it's taken centuries to make all men include women, racial, ethnic, and sexual minorities, and people with disabilities. To claim that any humans are of unequal value is to let the camel's nose inside the tent. The Nazis' first victims were those with mental disabilities, the idiots and lunatics, as Locke would have characterized them. These, they said, were empty husks, lives not worthy of life. The first to be killed were German children and adults who were deemed worthy of being euthanized in a program known as T4, after the street where the plans were launched for Tiergarten. Stasse. The methods developed in this program were used in the mass extermination of Jews and other despised minorities. It was the same design of showers. The design of showers was um, first uh, applied in the homes of the mentally disabled. The same gas, which was later altered, even the same equipment and personnel were shipped east and deployed to eliminate another group whose lives were thought unworthy of life. But surely, you might respond, the program to kill the inhabitants of the sanatoria for the mentally ill and the cognitively impaired on the one hand and on the other, the genocide that followed, were two horrendous but unrelated excesses of a tyrannical regime. However, the words of the perpet perpetrators, of uh, perpetrators of both, tell us something different. Dr. Menneke, one of the physicians engaged in both T4 and the gassing of Jews and other despised minorities, was examined by Herr Anthony, the defense attorney of Karl Brandt, who was a major architect of Project T4. And here's a bit of the dialogue. The attorney says, so you had two kinds of cases, the mentally ill, which had to be evaluated according to the med medical criteria, and those which had to be evaluated according to the political and racial criteria. Menneke, 
one simply cannot distinguish the two, Herr Anthony. The two cases are simply not divided and clearly separated one from the other. Peter Singer, when asked at a conference whether he was not concerned about such slippage today, replied that the circumstances that gave rise to the Nazis were unique and unlikely to be reproduced. As the nationalist populism that was stirred up during the election of 2016 and its aftermath have effectively given permission to the demons who previously refrained from the open avowal of anti-Semitism, the dehumanization of Muslims, anti-immigrant sentiment, and the most overt forms of white supremacy, complete with swastikas and images of lynchings. Uh, that certainty uh, should be shaken. Only by championing equality for all human beings can we silence those demons. We need to defend the equality of people with cognitive disabilities, however, not only because failing to do so can create dangers for the rest of us, but because the people with cognitive disabilities are the people we love, our neighbors, fellow citizens, and us in other circumstances. For all the reasons that we have a right to exist and flourish, so they have a right to be in the world in all the fullness of their being. Third point now is the question of moral individualism. Replacing the moral conception of human equality with the moral uh, significance of the comparability of intrinsic properties across species. That's sort of what I had that make-believe philosopher at the front uh, presumably respond to all the people who were claiming that they were human after all. Mm. It's become a matter of course in some philosophical circles to say that the capacities of a severely cognitively disabled human being are comparable to those of a dog. And I confess to being perplexed and puzzled by such statements. I'm not sure I understand what this means. One writer suggests that it is the comparison of what a dog and what a human can do on its own. If that is what is meant, then I fall short of what a dog can do on its own. The dog can hunt for its food, survive outdoors, does not need to dress itself, not to mention that a dog's sense of smell and hearing are so much more acute than my own. But one can object, these are not morally relevant categories. My response is, surely they are. That I cannot procure food on my own means I need social networks the dog doesn't need. The same applies to the ways a dog can survive on its own in ways that are impossible for me. And the fact that a dog has over 220 million olfactory receptors compared to my mere 5 million means that my perception of the world is significantly different and warrants different treatment for both me and my dog. Both dogs and humans desire affection, okay? But if my dog, whom I named Spinoza, because of the curious physical resemblance um, between the canine and the philosopher, uh, I think it's really the eyes, it's not really the hair, <laughs> is denied its rich over... <laughs> But if my dog is re denied his rich olfactory environment, I have most likely treated him with less moral consideration than had I deprived him of some petting. That my daughter is even less self-sufficient than me hardly makes her capabilities comparable to a dog's. If it's true, that a do it's true that a dog can't manage an IQ test and neither can my daughter, but most likely this is for different reasons. A human IQ test for a dog would be ludicrous. In the case of my daughter, we don't know exactly which of her disabilities prevents her from performing on one. It's also true that my daughter is without human speech, and so is my dog. Both do manage to get some of their needs and desires communicated to me, but my daughter is many times better at this than my dog, in part because as a fellow human, I can more easily understand what she wants, since a dog has wants I can scarcely imagine. 
What does one want if one has a sense of smell 40 times as powerful as our own? More important still, the ability to do things is not a necessary expression of what one understands. So it's not clear to me what's being compared. The fact of the matter is that each species has developed unique ways of cognizing the world. And these have developed in tandem with the sorts of things that matter to that species. As Franz Deval has said, every species is uniquely adapted to its own ecology. If that is the case, then we can at best make only analogical comparisons, not direct comparisons across species. There is not one scale of intelligence any more than there is one scala naturae. Fourth, the concern that rejecting moral individualism allows a pernicious and morally arbitrary uh, form of uh, preference which Peter Singer has dubbed speciesism. If, as seems to be the case, we need good reason to prefer one individual rather than another, then giving preference to an individual because she belongs to my own species seems simply not a good reason for this preference. This is like nepotism rather than fair competition in hiring. However, in the ordinary course of things, the favor we extend to members of our own family is compatible with neither harming nor dominating those of another family and gives us no license to do either. Indeed, racism, like, the noxious, like other noxious isms, is not merely a preference for one's own kind. We can make a distinction, I'd say, between what I call primal group, by which I mean a group based only on relational properties as criteria for membership on the one hand, and what I call a constituted group. That's to say a group based on the members all possessing certain qualifying traits on the other. A family, for example, is a primal group. One's membership in a family doesn't hinge on possessing a fashionable hair color or an IQ above 130. One belongs to a family only because one is born, married, or adopted into a family. Race is only mistakenly identified with primal groups. Scientists have made clear that biologically speaking, there is no such thing as race, just clusters of features that tend to be inherited together. Those features are superficial, and a study of DNA reveals that a black and white person are as likely to have as much DNA in common as two white people, and just as likely to differ in genetic material from one another as two members of the same race. Furthermore, conventions often determine race. A light-skinned person with an African ancestor was classified as white, and given the privileges associated with whiteness in French-owned New Orleans. Once the US purchased Louisiana, the same group became black, according to American law that stipulated that one drop of Negro blood was sufficient for the person to be considered a Negro. Examples of such arbitrariness abound. What is steadfast is that a subordinated race is characterized by the dominant race as possessing those traits it regards as undesirable, while members of the dominant race view themselves as those who possess desirable traits. Now, I submit that racism is less about preference for one's own race than we presume. Instead, it is largely about the dominant groups appropriation of traits that they deem desirable and the attribution of undesirable traits to the subordinated group. We see that racists will expel inv individuals from their own primal group if those individuals manifest undesirable traits. Again, as I, uh, uh, well, the Nazis' first venture in creating the Ubermensch were to rid themselves of, as I said, fellow human, fellow Germans who exhibited or carried undesirable traits. T4 originally 
executed only German children and adults, not Jewish ones, who at that time were thought unworthy of the kind mercies of the euthanasia. Early on and in rapid succession, <coughs> the regime passed and implemented the sterilization of inferiors laws, the law for the prevention of the progeny of hereditary diseases. These were aimed at Germans with the end of ridding the future populations of feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, and, uh, and schizophrenia. Miscegenation laws were vital to this variety of uh, Nazism. In Germany, it came in the form of the Nuremberg Laws, passed two years after Hitler's rise. In our own country, miscegenation laws remained in place after Brown versus Board of Education, uh, after Civil Rights Act, after all the other laws aimed at ending legal discrimination were passed. Why was miscegenation such a late uh, holdout? What's so terrible about the mixing of the races? Miscegenation threatens to break down the barriers holding the prized attributes in while keeping the devalued ones out of the constituted groups. As long as racial purity is guaranteed, members of the constitu constituted group are in sole possession of the intrinsic properties definitive of their privilege. When we define a category such as personhood, we create a constituted group based on the possession of cognitive capacities, which are thought to be morally superior traits. The arguments above suggest that such a category may be less compatible with a healthy respect for those without cognitive capacities, be they human or not. Groups based solely on relational properties, on the other hand, can be compatible with both a preference for one's own kind and with respect for other kinds, since the definition of who belongs is not tied to their possession of superior traits. What I hope to have established by now is that we should stop talking about marginal humans, that moral parity among all humans is a moral requirement for a decent world, that intrinsic properties are properties that are species specific even when they are similar across species, and that preference for one's own kind need not be pernicious. And that's, my, that's an argument against Peter Singer's uh, speciesism, for those of you who are familiar with that. To refute uh, the hypothesis I put forward earlier, uh, it remains for me to offer an alternative conception. The view that moral status depends on intrinsic rather than relational properties has long been the received view, not only among moral individualists or contemporary philosophers today who say that uh, species is not a morally relevant category, it only depends on what particular intrinsic properties that you have regardless of what you're uh, species is. Um, the difficulty for those who hold the view and who want to say that being human is morally significant is that one cannot specify morally relevant intrinsic properties possessed by all and only human beings. It seems that the only definition of the human that will stand up to scrutiny is one that seems woefully inadequate to serve as the basis for a morally thick concept. The only property that is, without question, distinctive of human beings and common to every human being, and not of non-human animals, is being of woman born. That is, being the offspring of another, of a human mother and a father. There we are. This deflationary definition directs us to no morally intrinsic properties that justify any moral treatment, much less moral preference, benign or ingen injurious. Not only is it a biological definition, it's a relational one. Uh, the relational property of being human binds all humans 
as all humans stand in this relation. This relationality is prior, morally and conceptually, to any intrinsic properties. We have moral obligations to other human beings for the simple reason that we find ourselves in relation to them. We cannot be the sorts of creatures we are except by being in relationship to other human beings. How, uh, why should such relations have any normative content? Why should they be prescriptive and tell us what we ought to do? Well, let's start by considering the parent-child relationship. The fact that my daughter is my daughter creates a set of moral obligations to her that others do not have and that I can't forego without well-warranted reproach. These obligations are temporally and ontologically prior to my knowing anything about her other than that she is dependent on me, where dependency, again, is a relational property. The dependency of a child on a parent means that it is the parent's responsibility to assure the child's welfare as best as one is able. Even external constraints may not limit one's obligation if it is possible for parents to fight against such obstacles in order to care for their child. Being in relation obliges one. I start with this relation not only because it's the most familiar, but also because it's the most universal. That is, when mother is understood as any person, male or female, uh, who takes on the responsibility of caring for a child. Aside from species membership, if there is any property that all humans who survive birth have in common, it is that they are some mother's child. That is, each of us, if we are to survive, much less thrive, must be in a relationship of care to one or more mothering persons. That relationship leaves indelible marks on the human psyche. Among these are the significance of the human form itself. One passage I cited earlier from Locke is an example of how philosophers, while acknowledging our corporeality, regard the casing, this casing of our cognitive capacities, as rather inconsequential. Yet we develop our connection with others in a specific sort of body. We are cared for by a mother with a specifically human body. It is inevitable that we then incorporate a human form in any sense of self that we develop. Not all relations are as demanding as parenthood. The obligation of friendship, for example, will dissolve when the relationship ends. Contractual relations have explicit entry and exit options. Obligations hold for all who occupy the relational role, but they bind those who actually occupy them. That is, um, so that I, as a parent, have a strong mo moral obligation to my child. I, as a friend, commit myself to certain obligations while we remain friends. I, as a citizen, have obligations to my fellow citizens. Notice, however, that there are constraints with respect to who can enter into these relations. Only another human being can be your child or your fellow citizen, although it seems false that only humans can be your friends. Uh, blind disability scholar uh, wrote upon the death of his beloved dog, when your service dog dies, there simply aren't enough antidepressants. However, <coughs> friendships with grizzly bears, lions, and even human-raised adult chimpanzees are ill-advised. The relation we have to any other human being, not any particular human being, however, is not simply the outermost ring of a set of relations that are possible with other humans. Were that the case, then the obligations that we would have would get weaker as the rings become larger. Instead, the relations which we have to all other human beings begin with a relationship that we have to ourselves. As much as we experience ourselves as singular entities, an important insight developed by feminist philosophers is that the self is both effectively and constitutively relation relational. It's a self that's nourished, defined, and constructed in relationship with others. 
Both the relations I'm engaged in and the circumstances shaping who I am are contingent. They could have been otherwise. The scope of those conditions that could have been otherwise are possibilities of any other and only another human being. We can represent this uh, in a philosophical um, conceit called uh, set of possible worlds. You know, we talk about the set of near possible worlds in which my situation is different than it is, perhaps only slightly, perhaps very different. The actual I stands in this kind of modal relation with all the eyes in all the near possible worlds to the actual world. The reversibility of perspectives that gives us moral law, such as the categorical imperative in which I attempt to understand the other's situation from the other's own vantage point, are based on such possible imaginings. There need to be no causal line that would connect my current fate to that of another for me to stand in this relationship to another I. That I that I am now could have been born with a congenital dis disability that made me incapable of being taught to read or write. Yet I can imagine some near possible world in which that would have been me. There's even some near possible world where I might have been an, an encephalitic infant who failed to survive beyond a few months. Uh, yet with apologies to Kafka, there's no possible world, certainly no near possible world, in which I might have been born a large bug, or a dog, or even as close an evolutionary uh, cousin as a chimp. When we do engage with our modal selves, these other possible eyes, what we gain is moral access. That is, an opening, a conduit, to having moral regard for another. Moral access is a concept that I think we're missing when we try to assess the moral status and moral demands of the other. So let me explain what I mean by moral access. It's access to something that is morally significant in the world. There are times when such significance is entirely transparent to us, when our moral principles guide us in a reliable fashion, and when our empathy is already active and we understand how to respond. But in situations where another's plight, struggle, or needs go unnoticed, when we are indifferent or unaware of the impact of our actions on those whom we don't recognize as moral equals, we need something, a narrative, a tap on the shoulder, to shake us out of our indifference and to gain something that is more than epistemic access to the other. Uh, this access is to what the other cares about and her entitlement or right to have these cares taken into account. Thus, moral access is important if we, care, if we are to care about another's suffering and to understand the moral claim another has on us. The refugee in Cali, waiting to make a stowaway journey to the United Kingdom, was asking us to access his sense of distress, to share his indignation, to have us glimpse and maybe even share the pain of losing moral significance in the eyes of the world. How could they treat us this way? We are human beings. As a human being, I can place myself in what for me is a possible world, but for her is her actual world. And so I gain a measure of moral access to that world. The common humanity that the black protester invoked was to give the interlocutor access to the moral drama as she saw it in her different skin. And in so doing, she hoped to evoke the needed response. When I introduced my daughter and told you that she is the sort of individual who's written out of much moral theory, I was looking for a way to give you not just epistemic access, not just give you some facts about the matter, about who she is, as important as that is, but moral access, access to her moral worth. I bring forth for your consideration an actual someone, someone who happens to be my daughter. 
I'm a philosopher, uh, perhaps you are, <laughs> but I'm a philosopher standing here talking to you. You might have a daughter or a child. You have some understanding of how vital it is for you that your child should be respected as a moral equal. I am inviting you to consider if your son or daughter were like my own, would you consider her as morally the equal of a pig, much as you might like and respect pigs? This is an exhortation to the reader or hearer to take the ramp of moral access, to look at another human being as a possible I, whom we take an interest in, express a concern for, knowing that by virtue of this relation, the other exerts a moral authority over us. Now you might say, don't we also need moral access to the plight of animals who are made to suffer on account of humans' desires? I've argued that in the case of humans, we stand in morally significant relations prior to knowing anything of the morally salient traits of the other human being. Yet the knowledge of how we ought to fulfill particular obligations to the particular other is dependent on his or her morally salient capacities or potentials. We need to know these in order to know what an appropriate action would be. But we do not need this knowledge to know that we stand in a morally significant relationship to that individual. The other's humanity is sufficient for that knowledge. Although we can have important relations with some animals, the main root of our moral obligation to animals is not so much through relations, but through knowledge of their intrinsic traits as a particular animal or species of animal. When an animal exhibits what we take to be morally significant traits, behaviors, relationships, we ought to respond in a morally uh, responsible fashion. Being human is a sufficient condition for the stringent obligations we have to humans, but it needn't be a necessary condition. As we learn about the lives of animals, we recognize in them features that we respond to in human beings, their sociality, their cleverness, their reaction to pain, and their need for an environment in which to live out their species being. We learn that the orphaned uh, um, juvenile elephants rampage villages and kill humans, either because they were improperly socialized or because they're avenging the killing of their mothers. We see the mother of, of uh, Nim Chimpsky, uh, one of the chimps that was uh, taught to do sign language, trying to hide her infant from the researchers who will sna snatch him away. I watch my dog join in the celebration of my birthday by bringing me his favorite toy as others sing happy birthday. In all these cases, we deduce from the animal's behaviors what they care about in ways that are discernible to us. These animal behaviors are evident, are evidence <coughs> of morally important intrinsic properties that give us reason to respond to them in species appropriate ways just as intrinsic properties inform us of how to fulfill obligations to humans in species-specific ways. The moral access we gain to non-human animals comes primarily through behaviors that we recognize from our own interactions with other human beings. It will be more difficult and perhaps impossible to recognize morally relevant properties of beings as different from us as, say, the octopus. The epistemic limitations imposed by our different bodies and our different ways of life also impose limits to our moral access to non-humans. With animals other than humans, I cannot project an I into another possible universe where I am that being. But I can see myself in the Japanese internment camp in the jungle of Calais as the mother of a young black son lost to police brutality or the child of a police officer killed while on patrol. And I can see myself in the disabled person who, like my daughter, needs someone to speak for her. Each is a facet of myself refracted in the prism of possibility. 
It is the real as well as the possible relations to other human beings, not any set of intrinsic properties belonging exclusively to humans that ensure that being human will always remain morally significant. Thank you. I apologize if that was a little heavy on the philosophy. <laughs> but um, um, I hope you, <laughs> I hope that wasn't too much of a barrier to understanding the, the main points I was trying to get across. I'm happy to take questions, comments. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have heard during your, your stay here that at the moment the Embryo Act is being debated and it's, it's a very hot debate when it comes to this notion of moral access. You know, further in the talk earlier on, you mentioned the human fetus and the embryo as being in the, in the category of marginal mm -hmm. humans. Mm -hmm. Well, according to, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, in your opinion, would be the right stance to take when it comes to assessing the, the notion of moral, of moral access? Should we access from the point of view of the mother or from the point of view of the embryo and the fetus? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my own view would be that we need the moral access of the mother. I think now the question of whether we can have moral access to the embryo, uh, that's very difficult for me to, to see. You know, some people might take it as that you, you know, that, that, that is the case. Uh, but um, certainly when we're talking about embryos or we're talking about unborn, uh, humans, then uh, there's not just, as you point out, there's not just one point of view to talk about. And uh, so that becomes an extremely important uh, question, I think, in the way in which one looks at that situation. Um, in this paper, I um, limit myself <laughs> to talking about born, <laughs> a woman born. Uh, um, I think before birth, you get into a whole complicated set of characteristics. But the question of intrinsic properties, I think, holds that, you know, I mean, again, I would say the important properties to look at would be the relational ones rather than the intrinsic ones. Thank you for the enlightening experience that you shared with us, first of all. Um, I'd like to take up the question that was made uh, right now. Mm -hmm. because it is uh, very debatable in Malta at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as, as I see it, mm -hmm. it's a question of understanding the needs of a mother and a father mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and deciding whether to keep alive or destroy or not protect the embryo. So it's not like with like. H how can you explain this philosophically then? I, I, uh, you mean, why are the needs of the mother and father being taken into consideration rather than the life of the embryo? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we understand fully the needs of mothers and fathers who have children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not at the expense of destroying, in the process, 
or not protecting or mm -hmm. minimizing the health to, to give all the different aspects of the embryo, which is mm -hmm. a human being. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, one thing I think it's important to, uh, of course, keep in mind is that an embryo, I mean, right now we do not have the, I'm sorry, right now we don't have the technology to keep an embryo alive except in a woman's body, right? So um, another person has to be always involved in terms of that decision, right? The embryo isn't a freestanding being as yet, right? You don't get to be a freestanding being until uh, there's viability in pregnancy. We're just not a freestanding being. We, we are, we're always dependent on another. Every infant is dependent on someone, cannot survive without someone. But until birth, or until viability, um, only the mother can take, you know, be taken care of that fetus, right? Uh, now you could say, well, embryos are made sort of self-standing <sighs> because they're uh, frozen and taken out of the body and still <laughs> they have to go into some woman's body <laughs> in order to become a human being. <laughs> so there's still this, you know, the, there's still a kind of relationality there that is not, it's not a fungible relationality. So um, I, you know, honestly this is not territory I like to dive into. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello. Um, I, I really like um, your uh, talk and your uh, arguments. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, I must admit they are very convincing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I also particularly liked your notion of woman born, mm -hmm. which I, I find um, something which is fascinatingly, <laughs> if I can say, goes above all the philosophical mm -hmm. history <laughs> that uh, right. we have read. <laughs> Wasn't so women who wrote philosophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I also like um, this, this notion, and I, uh, at the same time, I have problems with this notion of me being as um, or looking at somebody else as a possible eye. Mm -hmm. I, I think I can see limitations in, in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because what if I don't see my the other as a possible eye? Like for example, um, I think I think if I'm not mistaken, um, Iris Marion Young speaks speaks of uh, a situation where um, some some um, survey. Mm -hmm. was was um, uh, held mm -hmm. where um, people were asked like what sort of health care mm -hmm. uh, would you want to have if you became severely disabled right right um, with the hope of, of having you know this notion of me uh, uh, the other as a possible eye right and lots of people said like um, I, I wouldn't want to live right right so so uh, this is all, all also right. very com confusing for okay. me. Okay. Although I can see the point of a yeah. possible, I think there are some cases where other people don't see themselves as mm -hmm. a possible eye. Mm -hmm. um, and in relation perhaps to the question that other, uh, that the, the yeah. previous questions, like yeah. uh, yeah. what would I do um, if I became in a situation where I would, would have the option or non-option of aborting. Right. I think the notion of a possible eye also doesn't hold because I am not in that situation. So I, I just like to... Okay, so let me explain ah. what I mean. Thank you. Okay. So what I mean about us being in the relation of a possible eye, that doesn't 
depend on my being able to know what you feel. That's, that's a, if you will, a sort of ontological fact about us, you know? The point about moral access, moral access is not empathy. It's empathy is both too broad and too limited for what I mean by moral access. Empathy depends on being able to really enter into the feelings of the other, right? I don't, I don't need to enter into the feelings of the person in the jungle of Calais to hear that he has a moral claim. That's what I mean, okay? And that moral claim exists whether a particular person recognizes it or not. No? Okay? So, um, uh, that's, that's the way in which I'm thinking about this, all right? And, uh, and the, the point is that, that that moral claim is because it is, you know, it's a possible lie. You know, so that, that, that is a kind of ground level moral commitment that we need to have, we may or may not have, but we need to have to every other human being. Hmm. And now we can talk about moral education and trying to form the moral imagination and all of that. But you know, when people are asked in the survey, they're not given any moral access to what it is to live a life in a disabled body, right? They're, they're just asked to imagine it and sort of, you know, just like that, you know? That they, right. That's that's the sort of thing I mean. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's 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 it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kitty, for your contribution. Um, the Foundation would like to thank you for being here with us. We would also like to thank the Fulbright Program, uh, the US Embassy, and the University of Malta, who, you know, without you, we wouldn't have made this visit possible. Um, we have a little gift to give you on behalf of the President's Foundation. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to ask you to look at our Facebook page, President's Foundation for the Wellbeing of Society, to get more information on our upcoming events, mainly the morning seminar marking International Family Day with foreign guest speaker Professor Francesco Belletti and a public lecture by Professor Susan Hirsch focusing on the rule of law. Thank you and see you next time. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>